Good evening, everyone. I think we'll get started. It's wonderful to see such a good group out this, this evening to uh, hear Dr. Rebecca Jansen present the C. Henry Smith Peace Lecture. My name is Marlene Epp, and I'd like to welcome you to Conrad Grable University College. I am currently the dean here at the college. I'm happy to host you tonight. Uh, before I go on to introduce uh, Dr. Jansen, I really need to tell you about other lectures that are happening here at the college this winter. And we have a rich and wonderful program of guest lectures here over the next few months uh, with Dr. Jansen beginning uh, the treats that we have in store. In uh, February, February 4th and 5th, will be the annual Bechtel Lectures in Anabaptist Mennonite Studies. And this year we are hosting Dr. Yannickan Smucker from Westchester University in Pennsylvania. Uh, Dr. Smucker is a specialist in the analysis uh, and the meaning of Amish and Mennonite quilts <coughs> compared with Hmong textiles. Mm -hmm. And she will be presenting her research here at a fundraising dinner for the Mennonite Studies program here at Conrad Grable on February 4th and doing a public lecture in the Grade Hall here on Friday, uh, February 5th. Shortly after that, the beginning of March, we will host uh, the Rodney and Lorna Sawatsky Visiting Scholar. This year we have the eminent, eminent Sir James Macmillan, a well-known British composer. We know he's well-known because he comes with the title of Sir. <laughs> and he'll be presenting the Sawatsky Lecture here on March 1st, uh, followed by a concert on, that he will be leading on March 6th. Then our own eminent Dr. Troy Osborne, uh, not a sir yet though, <laughs> will be uh, presenting the annual Benjamin Eby lecture where we feature the research and scholarship of one of our faculty members. Uh, Troy will be presenting on March 31st on the title, The Bottle, The Dagger, and The Ring, Church Discipline and Dutch Mennonite Identity in the 17th Century. So anything with daggers in the title is very intriguing. <laughs> uh, in addition to this, we have many wonderful music, uh, noon hour music concerts, so uh, I invite you to check out our website for details on, on these lectures. I hope to see you here for some of those. Uh, well, now to our guest this evening, Dr. Rebecca Jansen. Uh, Dr. Jansen is currently an assistant professor of Spanish at Bluffton University in Ohio. But we can boast that we gave her her start right here. She received a BA in History and Spanish from the University of Waterloo in 2007. And she lived here at Conrad Grable for four, for four years um, as a resident and associate student. So we're delighted to have you back here. She spoke to Community Supper here just prior to the lecture. Rebecca went on to pursue an MA and PhD at the University of Toronto, and her research there focused on Mexican literature and culture with special attention to religion, gender, and disability <coughs> studies. Her first book, The National Body in Mexican Literature, Collective Challenges to Biopolitical Control, was published in 2015 by Palgrave Macmillan. She was recently awarded the C. Henry Smith Peace Scholarship to work on her current project, which goes by the title Liminal Sovereignty, Mennonites and Mormons in Mexican pop Popular Culture. And I think today's lecture is a portion of that current research. The C. Henry Smith Peace Lecture is sponsored jointly by Bluffton University in Ohio and Goshen College in Indiana. Each year, a scholar, usually from one of those institutions, is awarded the opportunity to pursue her or his peace-related research in various venues. The topics vary widely, but the hope is that all of them are grounded somehow within the Anabaptist peace perspective. Each lecture is presented publicly at Bluffton and Goshen, and also at various other churches and colleges. And we are pleased that this is her, the inaugural presentation of this year's C. Henry Smith Peace Lecture. So welcome, Rebecca. Thank you. 
Well, thank you, Marlene, for that kind introduction. Um, and thanks to all of you for coming. I am very happy to be back here. So as Marlene was saying, this is where I studied. And so this is a place where I agonized over papers and exams and ate pizza late at night and got to know some great people. So I should explain that the topic um, for my lecture is what you can see here. It isn't as broad as the advertised title suggests. It relates to a book I'm writing, but it's far too big for this lecture. I will mention Mormons a few times, um, but and we can discuss them more later. I should also say that when I refer to Mennonites in Mexico, I mean the low German speaking Mennonites who moved there from Manitoba and Saskatchewan starting in 1922. So how did I come to an academic interest in these Mennonites from Mexico? I took Spanish in high school and university, and then I spent a year in Nicaragua under MCC SALT program. In my PhD work, I focused on how in 20th century Mexican literature, so novels and short stories, strange and unusual things happen to characters' bodies. They're blind, pus-filled, lose limbs, and so on. The implied message, I argue, critiques the Mexican state for being all-encompassing and oppressive. I argue further that we can imagine some of these strange happenings with characters' bodies as pointing towards a collective resistance against the state. In none of this academic research on Mexico did I encounter these Mennonites, but I knew from my dad that they were there and that they followed a rather separate way of life. What did that separateness mean? Did it signify that the Mexican state had a tolerant dimension um, or that it was weaker than it appeared? Or could the Mennonite way of life be seen as an instance of actual resistance to the state? I then began to wonder how these Mennonites were perceived and portrayed in Mexican popular culture and what light such portrayals shed on these people's lived experience with the state. So I first looked at the 2007 film, Luz Silenciosa or Silent Light, directed by Carlos Regadas. It's undoubtedly the slowest moving film you will ever <laughs> see. <laughs> then I looked at the 2011 book of photographs, Las Mujeres Flores or The Flower Women by Eunice Adorno. I also looked at a post-apocalyptic webcomic called Macburro, so McDonkey or McStupid, a TV show called Los Héroes del Norte, and so this guy over here is El Menona, the Mennonite. <laughs> um, he sells cheese, which is what Mennonites are known for in Mexico. Um, I also looked at The Bridge, with the US-Mexico version of the Swedish-Danish TV show Broen, which is similar to the 2006 Canadian film Bon Cop, Bad Cop. Um, further, I reviewed historical, sociological, and political literature on other minorities in Mexico, including Mormons from the US, um, who similarly appear in popular culture, Jewish people from Europe and the United States, Chinese people, and people from the Middle East. I found all of that interesting, but to narrow that down for this evening, I'll focus on a document prepared by the state in the years 1926 to 1951 for all foreign nationals living in Mexico. It's an identification document like the one we see here for Agonitha Vickard Weeb. Um, it's sort of like the biographical page in our passports, that the Mexican government required this document is significant, and the bits of information that, are, that it carries are interesting in their historical context. That information tells us something about how the Mexican government saw the Mennonites and other immigrant minorities, and how what it wanted to know about them fit into its vision um, for a larger Mexican society. The Mennonite documents also tell us about how this small group of people represented itself to the state, including how some of them were a little more creative than one might expect. Before getting into those ID papers, I should provide a brief history. Um, approximately 6,000 of these Mennonites moved, from Mexico, moved to Mexico from Manitoba and Saskatchewan in the 1920s. And they moved because the government in these provinces insisted that they send their children to English language public schools. For them, this was such a serious violation that they began to look for a new homeland. In 1921, their leaders met with uh, Mexico's president, Alvaro Obregón, he was very interested in their agricultural way of life um, because it would repopulate northern Mexico with what he considered desirable people. 
When he learned that these Mennonites did not plan to teach Spanish in their schools, he hesitated, but eventually gave them a written promise of their desired freedom. The Mennonites then purchased several blocks of land, which became their colonies. Nearly 5,000 of them moved to um, colonies near Ciudad Cuauhtémoc in Chihuahua, which is about 500 kilometers from El Paso, Texas. Um, and then approximately 1,000 more went 600 kilometers further south to Nuevo de Durango. They settled in villages. Each village had a school, a teacher, and a mayor to deal with secular matters. Each village also had a church building, or else shared one with a neighboring village. Their ministers, all elected and unsalaried, circulated from church to church. This kept people in the different villages united in one church fellowship, which was led by a bishop who also was elected. Each colony also had a secular overseer who represented the people in various governmental concerns. In subsequent decades, many of these Mennonites have moved on from Mexico. Today, they number approximately 80,000 there, 65,000 in Bolivia, 25,000 in Belize, 10,000 in Argentina, and 25,000 in Paraguay, and perhaps some 15,000 in the United States. Um, some of these numbers, especially in Paraguay, include people who didn't move there from Mexico. And all of these numbers are a bit hard to gauge because some of them are baptized church members, which are adults, and um, censuses in these countries are not always exact. Thousands have returned to Canada, some for seasonal labor in the summers, but many live here permanently. It's estimated that over the last five decades, if one counted those who returned, plus the children and grandchildren that they've had, the number could be close to 100,000. It must be said that recent changes to Canada's citizenship laws are um, changing these numbers significantly. Every once in a while, there are news stories um, about some of these Mennonites that leave us with mixed feelings. In 1992, CBC's The Fifth Estate carried a substantial program about their involvement in the drug trade. In 2004, and some of you may remember this, um, the magazine Saturday Night carried a long article with similar claims, and there are similar stories in the Mexican press. In March of last year, there was a slew of reports about how the town of Tabor, Alberta, had passed bylaws against swearing and drinking in public in order to deal with the purportedly rowdy behavior of young low German Mennonite men. When I hear such reports, I cringe, in part because I feel a certain shared identity. I'm also reminded of how in Ohio, when I see Amish and Old Order Mennonites, I'm tempted to go up to them and say, hey, I'm Mennonite too, but I don't do this. <laughs> um, then, when my students tell me about the quote-unquote crazy Amish parties in Eastern Ohio, that sense of shared identity gives way to ambivalence, and I think that maybe these conservative Mennonites are, you know, just like the rest of us. Like the Amish and Old Order Mennonites in the US and Canada, the Mennonites in Mexico have been portrayed in positive and negative terms. When they first arrived in Mexico, the Chihuahua Herald said, our impression of the Mennonites is extremely favorable. This is certainly the kind of people capable of settling a new area. And we have received the impression that the Mennonites will be one of the factors in developing the state of Chihuahua, that they will make the state important in manufacturing in the Republic. So far, they've been in an experimental stage, but even if this year's production is somewhat low, Mexican citizens will have an opportunity to see what is possible agriculturally, thanks to the Mennonites. Before long, some less positive accounts began to appear too, particularly accounts that complained that these people did not send their children to public schools and that they did not learn Spanish. Now back to these identification documents. I found them when I was in Mexico City last summer. I went to the National Archives hoping to find information about the Mennonite leaders who had made the agreements with President Obregón in 1921. Um, I didn't find that much about those leaders, but I did learn that during World War II, the Mexican secret police investigated Edgister or Bishop uh, Isaac M. Dick because they thought he might be a Nazi. They concluded that he was not. <laughs> but I was searching the archive database, and this is a screenshot of the database, um, which is a PDF document, um, and looking for their surnames, I found that there were a whole series of Mennonite surnames in the archives. And so then, I decided to look for my relatives. That led to documents with the name of my great-grandmother and those of five of my great aunts and uncles who immigrated to Mexico with their families, one in 1926 and the rest in 1948, in 1949. Being in the archives and seeing these papers was a profoundly moving experience. In some ways, they were very close to me and in other ways, so different. I was educated and fluent in English and Spanish. 
They mainly spoke low German. I was there happily doing academic research. They were rural immigrants. My dress does not distinguish me from surrounding society. Theirs did and does. Despite these and other differences, I found a deep connection. When I then posted the images of my relatives on Facebook, a Mormon friend in the US, that's a Facebook as you may or may not be familiar, um, a Mormon friend in the US asked me to look up people from his family who had also immigrated to Mexico, first in the late 19th century, and then after a brief foray in the United States between 1912 and 1922 because of the Mexican Revolution, uh, some returned to their colonies in Mexico. In fact, their colonies are not that far from some Mennonite colonies, and it's said that the Mennonites learned about cheese making from them. There's even a cheese in Mexico um, called queso menonita or Mennonite cheese. And so like, I like to tell the man who's selling me cheese that I'm Mennonite um, and you know that I have family in Chihuahua. And I then went back to the archives, which incidentally used to be a prison. So the galleries are organized around a central area like where you can be watched all the time. Um, and so you always feel like you're being seen. And the documents are held um, in the cells. So when I then found more of these ID papers, both Mormon and Mennonite, I began to believe that they carried a story. The story that I saw in these identification cards um, differs slightly from the histories of low German Mennonites. An excellent example is Royden Lowen's recent book, The Village Among Nations, Canadian Mennonites in a Transnational World. It's based on extensive interviews um, with many people and a close reading of Die Mennonitische Post, or the Mennonite Post, a bi-weekly German language newspaper read widely by Mennonites throughout Latin America and uh, Canada and the United States. Interestingly, historians of Mormons have tended to write similar accounts. Unfortunately, there's very little dialogue between these Mennonite and Mormon scholars and Mexican historians, economists, sociologists, public health scholars um, who routinely mention Mennonites and Mormons in their work. Bringing these groups of scholars together is one of my larger goals. But for today, we'll just talk about these identification papers and what they may mean. A key question is why did the Mexican government in 1926 begin to require these ID papers from all resident foreigners? Broadly speaking, there were two reasons. One relates to its desire to control its territory and the people in it. This is normal uh, for all governments. But for the Mexican government, there are special challenges. It was not yet a decade since the revolution had officially ended in 1917. Um, and there was ongoing armed conflict throughout the country. And it may well have had suspicions about foreigners, including foreign clergy in the Catholic Church who strongly opposed the Mexican Revolution, um, and US citizens living in Mexico who it was feared could prompt a military incursion, and the Mormons were US citizens, so there's some suspicion of them. There are also indications that the US was pressuring the Mexican government to keep tabs on foreigners living within its borders, because people from the Middle East, China, and elsewhere used the largely unguarded Mexico-US border um, to enter Mexico and then the United States. A second reason for requiring the identification papers was the revolutionary uh, government's desire to build a new society, indeed a new race. The emphasis on race may seem strange from our standpoint, at least if we ignore the racism in our own histories, but Jose Vasconcelos, uh, who was a minister of education in the 1920s in Mexico, had a vision about developing a new race one that would combine the country's Mexi um, indigenous and European people to form what he called a cosmic race that would be the light to the world. Um, it was a messianic vision of Mexicanness. And immigration had a part in this vision. According to historian Moises Gonzalez Navarro, one of the main reasons for encouraging immigration was to make the race more beautiful. The emphasis on appearances also influenced policies on poverty, since poor people, it was said, tended to be less attractive, and so by improving social conditions, Mexico would achieve a more beautiful race. Other ideas for building a new society also influenced Mexican governments. Lázaro Cárdenas, who became president in 1934, was a socialist who strongly believed in agrarian reform, so redistributing land from wealthy plantation owners to landless peasants. He also believed in public education, which in 1935 led to a serious crisis for the Mennonites as government inspectors closer schools in the state of Chihuahua. The Mennonites then advocated strongly, and nine months later, the president um, made a special decree and ordered that their schools be allowed to reopen. In addition to such social policies, the Mexican government issued treatises providing guidance for people on grooming and manners and how they should look and act. 
All of this provides the basis for looking at these identification papers of immigrants. Several questions on these papers or cards, they're just about half a sheet of paper, um, ask about people's appearance. The questions were modified slightly over the course of these 25 years, but they continue to relate to racial markers. By looking at the questions and the answers, we can learn what the Mexican government was looking for in its immigrants. We may also see how government officials at times seem to stretch some descriptions perhaps bringing the Mennonites closer to their vision for Mexico. The Mennonites, for their part, may also have been suspicious of these cards because um, it was not so long since the Canadian government had required them to fill up manpower registration cards in Canada during World War I. As for how the Mennonites presented themselves, there are small but suggestive variations, but generally they present themselves in their traditional dress and hairstyles, thus showing themselves to be separate. This is reminiscent of historian Anna Pegler Gordon's ideas about Chinese immigrants to the United States. She claims that the way these Chinese people presented themselves in immigration photography represents low level resistance. I will show you five of these identification cards and make various comments about them, but I should also say that I had two student assistants, Malika Thompson and Katie Driggers, examine the images as well. I wanted their first impressions of each image because I had already looked at them so often that I really needed fresh eyes. In many cases, my assistants noticed that the women looked scared and that some of the men were openly flirting with the camera, giving it a, hey girl, look. <laughs> in many of the images of both men and women, they said people had blank stares, you know, as if they were afraid of the camera. The first card we'll examine is the one we have here of Katharina Bickard Epp, who appears to be a fairly typical young Mennonite woman. According to my assistants, she has a mole and looks a bit angry. The top of this photograph, the Servicio de Migración Registro de Extranjeros, says that it's the Migration Services Registry of Foreigners. Um, it also tells us that the document was processed on July 15, 1933, and that this card validates Katharina's stay in Mexico. There are two photographs, as you may notice, one from the front, one in profile. Uh, on the left-hand side, we learned that she came to Mexico through Ciudad Juarez, which is just across the U.S. border from El Paso, Texas on July 13, 1922. So she was one of the first Mennonite arrivals. Still on the left-hand side, we see more about the kind of information that the Mexican government wanted. At the top, there are two columns for the person's features. Katharina's physical constitution, whatever that means, is marked as strong. Her stature is one meter 65 centimeters. Her hair is dark brown. Her eyes are clear brown. Her chin is low and she does not have a beard or mustache. <laughs> Back at the top, we have her color, which is said to be white. Her eyebrows are noted with a word that probably means open. Her nose is described as straight and high, and she does not have any particular features. The interesting thing to note here is that these, particulars, these features fall into a particular vision of whiteness. As noted, the Mexican government at that time wanted to develop a new race, and particularly by drawing more whiteness into its country. In her complementary information section, so I was just telling you about this part, and now we're moving on to this part, um, is we learned that Katharina was born in 1902, so she's 30, that her civil state is single, her occupation is her home, her first language is German, and that she speaks no other language. She's born in Saskatchewan, her current nationality is Canadian, and her religion is Mennonite. Her race, a category they have in addition to color, is white. Her place of residence is Campo, or Village 5, Via Cotema. So it doesn't say which Mennonite colony she lives in, and there are a couple that all have numbered villages, as well as names that are in German. One question in relation to this description of Katharina's features, which seem rather common and ordinary, is why were these details written down at all? Is the photograph not sufficient? Was it not trusted? Obviously, a Mexican government bureaucrat met with these individuals to establish that they were who they claimed they were and took down all this information. Also noteworthy is the fact that Katharina names David Redekop, via Cotemo Chihuahua, as her reference. His name appears on most of the Mennonite identification cards. He was from a small group of Mennonites who came to Mexico in 1924 from what was then the beginning of the Soviet Union at the same time as many Mennonites went to Paraguay and Canada. They were refugees, but their outlook was, we might say, more progressive than the old colony people. And before long, David Redekop became wealthy from commercial dealings with the old colony community, um, which was at that, it still remains actually the largest church among Mennonites in Mexico. 
It appears that they trusted him to help with some governmental matters, such as these identification cards. One last point of interest is that Catherine is 30 and unmarried. I can't imagine that was easy for her. The status could mean that she was marginalized in her community, and combined with her signature, which we see below her photograph, suggests a low level of education, even compared to the rest of her community. Or perhaps she writes this way because of difficulties with fine motor skills, which could also relate to the fact that she's not married. I doubt she trusted the photograph much either. Um, our second image here is a little less clear. It's of Heinrich Berg Lowen. Um, I should mention that in Mexico, people officially have two surnames, their paternal surname and their maternal surname. Um, and Mennonite documents are not always exact. Um, sometimes women are classified by their married surname, when in Mexican government documents you should be classified by your birth surname, and then at the end you can have your married surname, even if women in Mennonite communities would colloquially use their married surnames. Um, Low German Mennonite men also typically put their mother's name, their mother's surname as their middle name, um, and which sometimes gets confused on these cards. And then, um, so Heinrich, let's say his paternal surname was Berg and his maternal surname is Lowen, as this card suggests, would be Heinrich L. Berg. But looking at other photographs of people who we know all of their lineage and genealogy as they're a bit more famous, his name, he could go by Heinrich B. Lowen, and so when he went to the government office, this is what they write down. Um, so he's a middle-aged man who wears glasses, and according to my students, he has a blank stare. His card was processed on July 8, 1933, approximately the same time as Katharina's, and he came to Mexico around the same time as her. He wears the stereotypical Mennonite overalls. From the description, we learn that he has a medium physical constitution, is a meter 80 centimeters tall, is blonde with blue eyes, has a prominent chin, and does not have a beard or a mustache. The question about whether a person has a beard or mustache seems a little odd, like you can just shave them off. <laughs> Um, Heinrich also has bushy and open eyebrows. His nose is said to be straight and horizontal, but if you kind of zoom in, it looks a little bit round. So I wonder if the official was stretching things in order to make him seem a certain way. So Heinrich is 31. He's married. He's a farmer. He speaks German as his first language and claims to speak English as well. Perhaps since he was 19 when he moved to Mexico, he had some English schooling in Canada. He's described as Canadense or Canadian a common tempo, and Mennonite, and white. He also lives in Combo 5, Cotemoc, and he too gives David Redekop as his reference. Now, the strange thing is here, he only signs his first name, and then at the top there, you can see that he writes Berg. Um, and so he's deliberately or accidentally disturbing the order on the card. His photograph too suggests, I think, a little bit of control over his own image. Our third image here is of Helena Bergen Friesen. She's 19. But according to my students, she almost looks middle-aged. Um, her card was processed in 1935, two years after those of Heinrich and Katharina, when she became of age, so at 19. She's said to have a regular physical constitution, is a meter 63 centimeters tall, her hair is dark, and her eyes are brown. She has a straight chin. Her eyebrows are sparse. Her nose is apparently sinuous and horizontal, <laughs> and she has no beard, mustache, or particular features. She works at home, is white, and her listed reference is also David Redekop. The most interesting thing I find about Helena's card is uh, that she seems to have modified her own appearance by tweezing her eyebrows, and it almost looks like she's wearing makeup. And so the identification card is based on this modified appearance. So I wonder if the church allowed her to touch up her appearance in these ways, and since she wasn't married, it's also possible she wasn't yet a church member, and so the rules would be much less strict for her. Um, she seems to be defying Mennonite stereotypes for government officials. Our fourth card is uh, Bernhard Van Mantegro. He's 24, but my student side was a teenager. It could be that the photograph is quite old. Um, they noted his pointy ears and stern look. He, his card was processed in 1940, um, later than the first three cards we looked at, and also much later than his 19th birthday. On the right hand side, you read he has a strong constitution, he's dark hair, blue eyes, a straight chin. He also is white, has bushy eyebrows, and a straight and sinuous nose. I really don't know what that means, but that's what they're writing. He's married, he's a farmer, and while he speaks German as his first language, he's also said to speak Spanish. He's born in Manitoba and is Canadian, and he came to Mexico as a small child. He lives in Campo 11 in Cuauhtémoc, and he, lives, he also lists David Redekop as his residence as his contact. 
Um, the most interesting feature about Bernhard is that he claims to speak Spanish as a second language because in 1940, very few Mennonites were undertaking Spanish studies of any kind. Had he just picked it up? That he told the official he could speak Spanish, even if he wasn't fluent in it, suggests a desire to identify with Mexico, or perhaps the official wanted him to be more Mexican than what he was saying. Our final image is of Justina Weeb, um, who my students described as a pretty lady with brown eyes and brown hair. She's also my great aunt, um, and she belongs to the group of family members that immigrated to Mexico in 1948. And this migration card is from 1949, by far the latest of the five we're looking at. The categories of the cards have evolved slightly. Her photograph is similar to the others, except in her profile, she's facing what I would call the wrong way. Um, this happens in very few photographs, but she's definitely not the only one. So there's a few um, things about her. Her nose is straight. Her, eye, her eyebrows are bushy or populated. Um, she's white. <laughs> She has a medium complexion, her eyes are uh, brown, her hair is brown, her mouth is regular. So there's nothing about her chin anymore, it's about the mouth. Um, an identifying feature is a scar on her right hand. She's 22, single, and works at home. Her first language is Dutch, but she also speaks English, and she's said to be from the white race. The references to her language abilities are also interesting to me. That she could speak English is due to the fact that she completed elementary school in Saskatchewan before her family moved to Mexico. But why does the card say her primary language is Dutch? And this appears on several um, Mennonite identification cards uh, after World War II. Um, maybe they said Dutch because after World War II, everyone wanted to avoid being seen as German. Or maybe when she was speaking, she was speaking through an interpreter or in kind of half Spanish, half Low German, and she said Deutsch, which the, is how you can say Low German, but then the man thinks it says Dutch. Who knows? Interestingly, uh, Justina's card was issued in the Mexican consulate in El Paso, and her residence is said to be Osler, Saskatchewan, where she was born. But how, that's not actually possible, and for this person I had a few more things to go on. Um, meanwhile, she named her mother, Gertrude Weave, as her contact and reference in Mexico. I asked my dad about this, and he said that his grandmother and uncles and aunts moved to Mexico in the fall of 1948, but that they'd had some issues with their immigration process, and so they had to leave Mexico and re-enter. That explains a visit to the consulate in El Paso. And the stipulation that she entered Mexico early in the following year may just have referred to the fact that she needed to re-enter to become um, the, Mennonite, the Mexican equivalent of a permanent resident. I also have several questions about her appearance. That her nose is said to be straight is intriguing. Uh, it's not. Um, <laughs> did the official stretch things so as to make her fit a racial type? And she's not wearing a head covering and has short styled hair. That really surprised me because even the other woman who maybe looked like she was wearing makeup still was um, looked like she had long hair. So I learned that Aunt Justina had always been very stylish, according to my Aunt Gert. That is until the day she got married, after which she said, okay, I'm adapting to the tradition entirely. Well, I don't know what she said, but that is what she did. Now, having presented these five papers, I would now like to make some further interpretive comments about the portrayal of the people on them. My academic field is literary and cultural studies, which leads to a consideration of images and illusions and hints in order to discern a message that may not be obvious on the surface. I would use the term aesthetics of suspicion to describe the immigration documents, aesthetics being an area of study that deals with the principles of beauty and, yeah, kind of like pretty things. Um, and suspicion relates to possibility, guilt, and questions. Art historian Dave Beach has used the term to describe the forces beyond an image that form it reminding us that we should not take an image at face value, that we should be suspicious of them. It's an intriguing concept for me. In the context of this talk, I want to think about it differently. I'm thinking about what we see in the image, and I'm asking if there's anything about these papers and photographs that suggests that either the Mennonites or the government were suspicious, ambivalent, or uncertain about one another. And considering this question, we should note first that aside from the photograph and the written descriptions that are on the identification papers, the basic policy of the government requiring them suggests a degree of suspicion and uncertainty about foreigners living within Mexico's borders. What might they be up to? Could they cause trouble? There were different kinds of foreigners and the reasons for suspicions would vary. With the Mennonites, the government will not have suspected that they might join an armed rebellion or support a political opposition movement as they uh, don't vote and are um, exempt from military service. But their separateness raised questions. It suggested an unwillingness to participate in the agenda of building a new society. 
Certainly, they're making a substantial economic contribution, particularly with their agricultural productivity, but they wouldn't integrate. Their dress was different, and they wouldn't teach Spanish or the government's curriculum in their schools. So it's understandable um, that there would be uh, some questions about them and their relation to the government's plans. When we now turn to the identification papers themselves and to what we see on them, there are some things that seem noteworthy. In terms of the written descriptions about the Mennonites, there are a few things that stand out. One is that they repeatedly describe people's noses as straight when they're not. Another is a dual emphasis, like in terms of skin color and race, on people's whiteness. But what can we make of these tendencies? They reflected the official's desire to align the Mennonites more closely to what Mexico was looking for in immigrants, as if to make them appear a little more suitable for the agenda of building a new society. Um, to seek a better understanding of this, I checked the identification cards of Mormons, only to find that they followed a similar pattern. Perhaps these officials had not seen many European descended people. This could be what some scholars refer to as cross-race bias, meaning that um, the officials follow their preconceived ideas about what people of other racial backgrounds look like, regardless of whether they actually look that way. And how did the Mennonites represent themselves in these papers? I noted before that some of them seemed to have pushed the limits of what was expected in their communities. One woman wore makeup and tweezed her eyebrows, another wore her hair in a more Spanish way, and one man claimed to speak Spanish. Mormon women, like the one we have here, uh, Grace Franz Ruth Clough, um, also seem to wear more revealing clothing than I might have expected, and that is required by um, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, uh, otherwise known as Mormons. Um, this could reflect a desire to be seen as slightly less separate and a little more open to Mexican society. Historian Teresa Alfaro Belcamp, who studied immigrants from the Middle East and Mexico, says that to an extent they became Mexican, this is Middle Eastern people, without fitting into the traditional ideas about what being Mexican was. She argues that they thus created a type of Mexican pluralism. I find this very interesting um, in the idea that a country with such a centralizing and unitary ideology could still have room for other interpretations. That is, that it could have an element of pluralism. I believe the Mennonite experience also supports this view. As long as the policy requiring these identification papers was in place, so until 1951, the Mennonites complied with it, but all the while they showed themselves to be distinct and separate. This represents a certain kind of resistance to Mexico's all-encompassing state. In subsequent decades, many things about the Mennonite way of life in Mexico have changed. In most of the colonies, people now drive cars and trucks. They're plugged into the government's electricity system, again, in most, but not all colonies. They've built factories, particularly for farm machinery, and the products are sold all over Mexico. In economic matters, their interaction with broader Mexican society has increased greatly. But in other ways, they remain fairly separate. In this context, it's not surprising that they've attracted curiosity and interest. At the beginning of this talk, I referred to Carlos Regala's 2007 film Silent Light and to Eunice Adorno's 2011 book of photographs, The Flower Women. I would like to comment briefly on how Mennonites are portrayed in these two productions. The film, as we may know, runs for two and a half hours. <laughs> it's set. In the past, I made, I made my student workers watch it too because I was like, I just can't watch this again. Um, it's set in the pastoral landscape of the Manitoba colony near Cuauhtémoc, one of the first places that Mennonites went to in Mexico. It centers on a married Mennonite man, Yahon, who has an affair and on his resulting struggles. His wife, Esther, um, you can kind of see here, played by the Canadian author, Miriam Taves, who learned low German for this film, feels awful. And as she and Yahon drive through the colony, she gets out of the car into a rainstorm and dies of a broken heart about 10 minutes after this shot. <laughs> um, the film has been highly acclaimed by Mexican and international critics, but Mennonites are much less impressed because of the various errors in representation, particularly in terms of dress. Um, I've also noted that the song they sing at Esther's funeral is actually an engagement hymn. If you look up the number in the Old Colony Mennonite Gazan book, like the hymn book that they use in their churches, so, I mean, I think these errors are what make literature and culture interesting, but the Mennonite community is not impressed. Um, there is a report in a local Mennonite newspaper in Mexico that features a radio debate between um, a preacher in the Old Colony Church, so a minister, and one of the actors in the film. And the film, if you watch the extra credits, also interviews people who feel a little bit ripped off about their, how their houses were used, used, like they just feel like they weren't really consulted. 
Um, moreover, the Mennonite community seems generally two-dimensional, or barely people, in this film. Mirren Taves' novel, Irma Voth, from 2011, fictionalizes her experience around the film. The novel presents an interview with the director of Campo Siete, so obviously an allusion to Silent Light, and the director is obviously an allusion to Regalas. So this director states, I don't care about the Mennonites as a group, not at all. I'm interested in the fact that nobody would understand their language and that they were uniform. There's no distinction, one from the other. And so they are props, essentially, for pure emotion. What Regalas is saying is that the Mennonites are an excellent backdrop for his ideas, but their language is so weird that they're just not worth understanding. He seems even less interested in who they are than the Mexican officials who, between 1926 and 1951, wrote up descriptions for the identification documents. Now, the 2011 book of photographs, The Flower Women, um, by Eunice Adorno, reflects a very different approach. It features Mennonite women predominantly. Um, there's maybe three pictures of men in the collection in the colonies of Nuevo de Durango. So one of the first ones that I mentioned, and La Onda Zacatecas, uh, a colony that just celebrated its 50th anniversary. In one commentary, an interview, Adorno says that when she first went to these colonies, she saw teenage girls standing um, in the shade of a tree, and so she walked up to them. Language differences made communication difficult, but before long, uh, she gained the trust of a female dentist, and through her, and kind of this approval of someone in the community, other girls and women invited her into their houses for coffee, for walks in their gardens, to see their family pictures, embroidery, and their colorful plates and dishes. And here's an example of um, one of my favorite pictures in this collection, because it shows what someone wanted to show off, obviously, this is, um, like this used to be a chocolate, and it comes from the United States because it's listed first in grams, and everything in Mexico and Canada is listed, it's listed first in ounces, sorry, and everything in Mexico and Canada is listed first in grams. So someone had got this special in the US, or sent it back from the US, maybe her husband works there. Um, and so I just love this, that then the photographer got a chance to share this beautiful image with all of us. And so Adorno says, I was amazed by the feminine universe so full of color. It's a reminder of how, even with the identification papers restrictions, some women found ways of being creative. Um, Adorno respected her subjects and took them seriously. What we see in Adorno's work of image making could also be described as peacemaking, which of course is a key reason for this annual lecture series in the name of C. Henry Smith. And that lesson in peacemaking can be applied widely, be it in relation to traditional low German speaking Mennonites, Aboriginal people or newly arriving refugees. We can imagine that many newcomers have to get documents like those I've been discussing. People need them in order to access basic social services and to function in our society. At times, this may feel to them as if they are pressured to conform, and almost certainly they long to be understood and portrayed as they are. They need this understanding in order to flourish, as do we all. Thank you. some time for questions and responses, uh, so I, I welcome those. I'd just like to ask about eyebrows. Is there something in racial profiling that eyebrows descriptors are so important, do you know? I had never come across this terminology before in my life, or the terminology that describes the noses, like the sinuous thing. Um, I looked up kind of glossaries and you know racial categories, and I'm just it's not in the utopian essays that describe the Mexican race. That just has general ideas about beauty. So I think it came from some Mexican government official who read this. Um, Mexican genetic theory and like theories about beauty and eugenics come from Lamarck, a French eugenicist slash genetic theorist. And so possibly it was in his work. I was wondering about the two or three villages you mentioned that Beginning. Were these villages that were established when they arrived, or did the Mennonites uh, populate and start the villages from scratch? That's a really good question. Um, before the Mennonites moved to the area near Ciudad Cuauhtémoc, um, there it was a very, very, very small village. It was not called Ciudad Cuauhtémoc. It had a different name, but Cuauhtémoc is an important 
person in the revolutionary understanding of Mexican history, so they renamed it once it became more important. It was just like um, a little stop on the railroad for mining. And so the Mennonites, um, the earliest colonies were actually not purchased, they're rented in a 99 year lease from the Mexican government, so that's expiring in 2021. Um, and so people have permits for this land, but they don't own it in the same way that they own land in newer colonies. Um, and so when land in those colonies is bought and sold, it's a whole different thing. Um, but so they started them much in the same way that people in Canada started um, the Mennonite settlement areas in southern Manitoba and Saskatchewan. There were um, indigenous people there and along kind of the borders of particularly the Manitoba colony, there's Manitoba and Swift current colonies are next to each other near Cortema. Anyway, um, that they had ongoing conflict um, at the same time as the Mexican government was letting these Mennonites have large land grants, they were also distributing land in what were called ejidos, so collectively owned land for indigenous people. And so they wanted access to the same land that was being given to the Mennonites. So they started these colonies, like there were not roads there, there were, not, there were no houses, there were no schools, like there wasn't what we would think of as the colonies today. It was the desert. been able to find any diaries or memoirs to help you in your studies? That's an excellent question. There are some diaries particularly of the church leaders, like Isaac M. Dick, the bishop, um, has some famous, his memoirs, I've read a part of them that's been translated both into Spanish and English, as my ability to read Gothic script is not yet perfect. <laughs> um, and the unfortunate part is that often people in these communities um, they can read and write at a basic level in order to understand the Bible and the church hymn book, and perhaps their church services, which are in German, but um, often they're not able to read or write that much. A very interesting way to access the stories of low German people, um, particularly people who aren't leaders, um, is through the letters that they write in the Mennonitische Post. Um, that I have been able to read and I can understand, and. It's people, and there have been some really great studies of these letters actually, and so it's people who are looking for their relatives, wondering what their relatives are doing because in the past there was no way to really phone them if people didn't have electricity, and they tend to live in such remote areas that often those technologies, even if they were permitted, are difficult to use. Um, and so those letters really give you a window into what's important to people, um, so family and what they're doing and things like that. Um, the book that I mentioned, this Village Among Nations, is also based on a lot of oral history interviews, and so that's been helpful to me, but, so I rely on the letters. That's where my abilities and the existing material meet. What response did you get from the people whose background you were inter uh, discovering? The church leaders or municipal officials, or maybe even some people in Ontario about background? <coughs> Do you have any response? What did they make of you? Well, I did something that was very smart. I went to Mexico with my dad. <laughs> and my dad has done um, a lot of work through MCC to do paperwork for low German people. Um, and so people were incredibly, incredibly kind, like over the top kind. Um, we were not, I mean, I was expecting that people would be kind as we are related to some of these people but the level of hospitality we received was incredible. I don't know that um, everyone always understood what I was doing, but the way I was explaining to some of my relatives, like, I just want to know what Mexican people think of the colonies. And they're like, oh, we want to know too. So let's you find out. <laughs> um, and so uh, part of my work is funded by the Delbert Platt Foundation. And so the board reads my reports and I assume tells people what I'm doing. Um, but I am, this is kind of the first presentation I've done to a non-Latin American studies or Mexican studies audience, and so I would like to do more of this. I can go back to Mexico this summer, like I have funding for that, and um, I'd like to be able to talk to people like this is what I found, but so much of the research, even with my very basic knowledge, is quite wrong. Um, like the facts are not, they don't correspond with what um, people were telling us and what you can read in the archives, and so, 
I mean, of course, what people say and what's in an archive are different, and so to compare them and see, uh, you know, what was important to different groups of people. But so I'm really looking forward to that, to being able to hopefully discuss now that I've had time to reflect, to turn back. Um, and we have some visitors from a little bit more southern in Ontario who know a lot more about Lord German Mennonites than I do. So I'm looking forward to learning from them as well. How were these cards? Were these cards something they had to carry on them all the time? Mm -hmm. So these were just kept at home. I mean, these are obviously the official copies, or are these ones they had? No, they had two copies. That's what it says on like the back side of them. Um, and the Mexican government really doesn't have a very effective sovereignty over its territory. Like I was just thinking about this on my way here. The Mennonites really only started getting processed in 1932, so about eight years after they it was the law. And I think the Mennonites were naturally suspicious of the government, but I think that that it took so long suggests that they were not really interested in what was happening in rural Chihuahua and Durango. Um, that, so even if there was the law to carry them, I don't think that would have been required. Yeah? Why did, why did the Mexican government stop issuing the ID cards? I don't know. Um, there is, in about 1953, 1954, the secret police makes inquiries into tons and tons and tons of Mennonites. So this is two years after. And I think that's when they first began applying for Mexican citizenship. Um, and so like being eligible for Mexican passports. And so I think that they needed still some kind of document, but it's not a document that was in the archives um, and that they tended to begin becoming Mexican citizens. So it was less necessary for Mennonites and for all other foreigners. Um, that was also a time the governments changed in 1952. Like they were all from the same political party, but each six year um, president has a different approach. So um, he was not, again, like no one really cares about rural Mexico, who is the leader of the country. And so he would have been like, okay, we're gonna do something else. And for these foreigners living in Mexico City, we'll do something else for them. Yeah. And have you compared the ID cards of these Mexican Mennonites with passports of, of actual Mexicans at that time and seeing if they've asked the same questions? Like, do normal passports of Mexicans say that their nose are sinuous? Um, that's a really good question and I should do that. Um, but what I have looked at is other documents from this period that are from the Ministry of Education and they're like measuring Mexican school kids. They're like, the average height of a six-year-old is this. Therefore, we need to put them in the height of a chair, in this height of a chair. Only we want to buy the same chair for grades one through three, so we're going to average. This is actually what they're doing. We're going to average the heights of, you know, six, seven, and eight-year-olds and find the mean. And so they were measuring people like crazy. But I don't know if the features were things that they were looking at in their own population. So it's a great question. Thank you. Yeah. I've always had the feeling that uh, many of the people would do a lot of traveling. They come. They go to Mexico. They come to Canada. They would be there for a period, then they would go back to Mexico. How was that understood by the government? And what were some of the reasons for that? I know it might have been work that took them out, but that has caused other issues to be a problem. Yeah, um, I think the reasons that people travel so much are primarily economic. Um, there have been really large periods of significant drought in Mexico, particularly before the colonies used um, electricity, like now they irrigate, but through electricity, and the colonies that don't have electricity use diesel for irrigation. Um, and so before that technology was available, there was um, e even higher levels of poverty. And so people need to migrate to um, do migrant farm labor in the summers. And there's still, of course, uh, poverty in, among Mennonites, low German seeking Mennonites in Mexico. Um, I think, or what we noticed, some people telling us, this is it in um, the colonies, they're like, oh, those people aren't in their house right now, they went back to Canada and then they're gonna buy a roof and then they're gonna come home. Um, or you see like, yeah, like half built houses and you're like, oh, what happened to those people? Oh, well, they might come back. I think that that creates a certain instability, but also um, what you can notice with the numbers of Mennonites um, who live in Mexico, that it is, much, much, much smaller than it would have been if everyone and their children had remained there. And so um, I think it creates a different sense of identity for these people that it's more, um, that there are commonalities between communities, say, around Elmer, Ontario, and Chihuahua, Mexico, and um, Belize, for example, that because of the shared religion and culture. Um, one of my friends, in fact, told me that on her first trip to Chihuahua, she's from Elmer, was like going to the mothership 
that she had heard about it all her life because, um, but had never been there. And so, but it was a very familiar culture. Um, I think because migration is such a common experience for Mexicans, like many, 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 many Mexican people have family who's living and working in the United States, who goes back and forth, um, they're frequently deported. And, and so the idea of constant movement actually brings Mennonites and Mexicans into a very similar relationship. And now that Canada's citizenship laws are changing, more Mennonites do summer farm work or go to in the United States. Like there are some low German Mennonites who are citizens, who, United States citizens who live in Texas, and there are um, large numbers of Mexican people of all backgrounds who go and do farm labor in Texas, Oklahoma, Nebraska, and Kansas. And so now Mennonites are part of that migration flow, um, again, for economic reasons for all of them. Last question. Well, for both back there. Uh, I was wondering if, aside from the example you mentioned of the Mexican government trying to close Mennonite schools, if there's any other specific instances of either persecution or laws that could have affected the Mennonites in particular even after the period you're looking at? Yeah, there are um, a number of instances where, like, the Mennonites were guaranteed certain exceptions, for example, from military service, from public schools. Those, I think, are the biggest ones. Um, and there have been several instances of conflicts. Um, I think the largest conflicts in the 1960s and 70s were over land. Um, in some cases, the Mexican government intervened on behalf of Mennonites to expel other people from their land. These were periods of agrarian uprising throughout Mexico and like populist movements. Um, recently, there have been some changes to the law of what in English we would call like freedom of religion laws. And so that has some Mennonite leaders worried about what their um, freedoms will be as all of their freedoms are guaranteed by presidential decree and they're not written into the law. The only things that are written into the law are um, saying that certain land is exempt from being ever redistributed through agrarian reform. And so that, I think, is an ongoing concern. Um, I think that most people who live in Mexico have an ongoing concern about their government um, and, <laughs> and economic instability. And so Mennonites are concerned, but for different reasons, but equally valid as all people in their country. Did you want one more? Yeah. yeah um, so uh, I'm going to ask you to speak a little bit outside of portrayal of Mennonites in Mexican culture. What is the Mexican, the Mennonite understanding of Mexican? Um, there's actually a really, really good MA thesis by Andrea Dick, um, who wrote exactly about this topic. She surveyed, um, it's from the 1940s and 50s, the Steinbeck Post, which was at that time another German language newspaper that also has letters about what people were trying to communicate with their family who had moved and who had stayed. Um, and she describes Mennonite racism against Mexicans, and there were allusions to this that one could perceive when talking to um, people in the colonies. Something that I found very curious was that um, people in the colonies, like for example, their businesses, will hire someone to be their accountant, to run their computers. Um, so things that require university education in a very particular subject area. Um, and one of, um, someone who was showing us around was explaining the derogatory things that people will say to these people, will say about their employees. And he was not in favor of them, but anyway, so there are some problems with that um, because Mennonites have been able to have incredible agricultural productivity, whereas the surrounding communities have not. Um, another thing that is very curious is that because like some colonies, like um, the Manitoba colony, which is quite large, and near Ciudad Cuauhtémoc, is within, like people can drive there and drive home, but other colonies are a little bit more isolated from a city. And so then like people are shipped in by uh, little buses to work on the colonies and then go home at night. Um, so I think there are some interesting economic interactions between very wealthy uh, low German speaking Mennonites in Mexico and other people in Mexico. I'm sure there are interesting relationships among within the colonies as well. People of different economic backgrounds, but I would say that there is a significant degree of um, lack of understanding. <laughs> well, I think we'll bring this to a, a close now, and um, I want to thank you, Rebecca, very much. It's wonderful to have new and fresh perspectives on familiar topics using new sources and new frameworks of analysis, so I uh, really enjoyed it. Uh, wish you well with the rest of your research thank project, you. and we look forward to 
seeing it published and uh, hopefully you. having you back here again sometime. Oh, thank you. So please join me. Thank you.